12 o'clock and uh, in usual hourglass fashion, we like to start on time and end on time. So uh, I'd like to, to start things off here by welcoming uh, all of you for uh, to attend uh, this, this forum. We're very excited today to be able to have our three guests. Um, Charlie Reisinger will be uh, presenting as our moderator today, and then Joel Walker and Na Dr. Nasley Hardy uh, are here as well. I'll let Charlie do a little bit more in-depth introduction of both of them as we go forward here. Um, like to thank our sponsors, Rogers and Associates, uh, as well as Millersville uh, University, who uh, typically we would be in their space at the Ware Center, um, but uh, today we are um, on a webinar. So uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and without, uh, oh, one more thing I need to mention um, is that we will not be taking questions during the presentation. However, there is a question and answer function on the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to submit questions through there. Um, so please do so if anything comes up. Uh, and if you see other people's responses uh, on the bottom of the screen or in that question and answer function that you like, you can hit the thumbs up button. And uh, then the questions that are at the top that have the most likes are the ones that we'll get to first. So uh, without further ado, I will let Charlie Reisinger, uh, who is the uh, Director of Technology at Penn Manor School District, um, and our moderator today, I'll let him take over. So thanks, Charlie. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that introduction, Jonathan. And uh, everyone who's watching, thank you for taking some time out of your day to uh, listen to our discussion. Uh, I'm keenly aware that time is one of our most precious commodities, so uh, we're all very, very excited that you uh, decide to spend some time with us this afternoon. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, my two colleagues, uh, my two friends, uh, to be very candid, colleagues and friends, uh, who will be uh, chatting with us this afternoon. Uh, first up is Dr. Nasli Hardy. Uh, Nasli is an Associate Professor of Computer Science at Millersville, Millersville University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she is also the Chair of the Women in Mathematics, Science, and Technology Conference at MU, the annual conference. And Nasli is also the Director of the Coding Confidence Summer Institute at Millersville University. And uh, we will most certainly be uh, discussing many of those initiatives and projects uh, this afternoon. So Nasli, welcome. Also with me, another uh, longtime friend and colleague is Joel Walker. Uh, Joel is the founder and the CEO of Industrial, Industrial Resolution. Uh, they are a software development firm here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Uh, in addition to that, Joel is also the chairman of the Board of Local Area Networks. That is a recently created not-for-profit organization uh, that's working for the betterment of the technology community in Lancaster. Joel is also the founder of PubForge, that is a technology-focused co-working space also in Lancaster. Uh, Joel is a uh, serial entrepreneur and, uh, and really an amazing individual as well. So Joel, welcome. Thanks. Nice to be Glad here. to have you here. Uh, so we are certainly connected by way of technology and uh, Joel, Nasley, and I have presented and worked together you know, for more than a decade on various initiatives in and around Lancaster County. Uh, we also happen to be connected by the Hair Club. Uh, you know, the length of our hair connects us in some ways as well. Uh, there we go, so Joel's is up, mine is down, and uh, Nasley's is down as well. So, uh, so I'm looking forward to a great discussion uh, with my two colleagues and partners. Uh, where I'd like to get started though is a brief discussion about, you know, why technology, the need for technology. You know, it doesn't, uh, it's, it's no surprise that computing and computer technology has impacted every area of our lives. You know, there's no industry, there's no human endeavor, you know, at this point that hasn't been touched or impacted or changed or accelerated by computing and computers, especially AI and, and algorithms today. Uh, you know, to underscore that, you know, that, that progress takes human talent. And in 2018, the Pennsylvania Workforce Development Board uh, recognized and published statistics that in Pennsylvania, uh, nearly 300,000 jobs of the future will require skills in science, technology, engineering, and, and mathematics, those STEM jobs. And not only just for the core programming piece, but over the next decade, uh, more than 70% uh, of new jobs that are being created will require computing and STEM skills. Uh, they also cited that, interestingly, that in spite of this growth, that in Pennsylvania, there are 17,000 unfilled computer science related jobs. 
And they also indicated that about half of all the STEM jobs in the Commonwealth, the upcoming STEM jobs, will require some level of computer science skills. Further, they said that five of the eight fastest growing occupations in the state are computer science related. So obviously this is a, a computer science technology is impacting our lives, impacting jobs in, in a huge way. You know, where I'd like to get started in this discussion um, is, you know, with what that looks like here in Lancaster in terms of hiring managers and firms and leaders hiring for computer related positions. You know, at Penn Manor over the years, we've really struggled to attract talent to come work um, in the school district. I think a big part of that is because the demand, you know, for, for jobs is high and the pool of available workers is, is often quite low. So first question to Joel, you know, can you talk to us a little bit about your experiences of, uh, around attracting and hiring uh, technology talent for your endeavors? Yes, yeah, sure. <clears throat> I'd be glad to. Um, so a little context. So Industrial Resolution, um, is, as Charlie said, a custom software development company, um, sort of evolved out of another company about 10 years ago. And through that evolution, one of the core questions that sort of drove our coming, coming to be was, you know, is it even possible for a, a computer programmer to have a lifelong employment opportunity? You know, um, is that even relevant in uh, today's, you know, the context of today's uh, workforce. And um, we, well, we probably wanted that to be so. Um, we definitely ad admitted that it's not, doesn't seem to be found anywhere around us. And so we've had this curious itch about what does it look like to create that? Um, one of the things that makes custom software development core to what we do and exciting is that um, the technology industry, as everybody knows, evolves so rapidly. We are constantly innovating ourselves right out of a job. It's one of the reasons it's hard to have a lifelong job. Um, technology advances so quickly, and by the time you've made that full investment and acquired the knowledge, guess what? It's time to upgrade, migrate, do the, you know, uh, uh, take on that new tech stack. So um, for people that work in that field, there is a very real pressure to keep your skills relevant um, and, and meaningful in, in the context of what the industry needs. Um, but I think that as we've played with this experiment over the past 10 years, um, we've really started to hone in on the fact that experience and uh, decision-making, problem-solving, are really the core skills that um, we are trying to engender within our people. What we've become very good at, and not just industrial resolution, like the industry at large, is learning new skills, very adaptable. It's like an evolved skill that most uh, programmers who've been in the business, you know, seem to, to acquire quickly because you do need to keep learning. Um, so with that in mind, the idea of retention and development of a workforce, especially, you know, in a place like Lancaster, which I think is very important in the context of this conversation, um, it's a place where we pride ourselves on stability. Um, we, you know, fiscally conservative, but meaningful work. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a really interesting place to sort of do business. So um, where I guess I'm going with all of this is that Lancaster does not have a huge tech workforce. We are not um, known for our, you know, uh, sharp tech skills or our huge tech companies. Yet, and I would say it makes up a very small portion of our actual workforce population. Um, but I would say that uh, hiring in this in this arena, what that means is that we have it's always been a uh, less than traditional route. We do not have a tremendous amount of career pathways to sort of get in and stay in um, in this area. Most of our, you know, um, most of the top tier graduates that that Dr. Uh, you know, Hardy you know, uh, puts out into the workforce, they end up taking jobs elsewhere, um, and. So what we've started to see and, and experience as a small company and have the most success with is actually looking for places in, um, across the country that are very similar in sort of like lifestyle, um, you know, salary, you know, comparable places of uh, cost of living and expanding our reach to hire people that are from other places. Because the reality is our, we, while we do have a very, uh, strong tech workforce, 
they're often working for companies that are from other places. And so you do very much exist in this global sort of um, economy. And what we've begun doing is uh, you know, bringing people in from outside because there simply isn't enough to be found here. Um, on the flip side of that coin, that means that our, um, our focus is around building those career pathways. So we really pride ourselves on bringing on an interns and apprentice, apprentices that will then stay with the company for a very long period of time. And, and as a result, we have a, we have a pretty successful track record of employee retention and um, seeing people skill up while working with us. So good. You're muted, Charlie, or at least I can oh. hear you. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> Quick uh, unmuting there. Joe, you really touched on something uh, essential there, and that's uh, the need for, you know, for workers to constantly learn, unlearn, and relearn, right? So it's not so much about learning one specific uh, programming environment or, you know, one computer architecture. It's about the relearning, right? It's, it's more about getting into a different mindset. Uh, Nasli, right. could you talk a little bit about, you know, the, the concept of computational thinking? Because I think it ties quite nicely into what Joel was discussing in terms of, you know, the reskilling of, of workers and that fast learning. Sure. So computational thinking and coding is actually an application of computational thinking. And computational thinking fundamentally expresses any problem into logical or structured components and find solutions often in a way that a computer could solve. And computational thinking could be broken down into many parts, but there are four broad parts. And um, one of them is, the first one is decomposition. So decomposition involves breaking a problem, a large problem, a complex problem into smaller and manageable parts. And then the second part, and again, these are very broad, but the second part is something called pattern recognition, which involves seeking and analyzing any related or often repeating data. Um, a third component is something we call abstraction, which involves pinpointing perhaps the most important information in any of those decomposed problem parts in the context of the larger problem. And then we have the algorithmic thinking, right? Which is, um, which is sort of the recipe, or it involves a, developing step-by-step -step solutions, usually something that could be replicated by others, right? So that is the fundamental of computational thinking, and coding in any language is an application of that, Charlie. Yeah, so it, would you, you know, for, for those that are, those not involved in computer science, would you describe it more of a, a philosophy of thinking, you know, a philosophy of problem solving, you know, are you, are you teaching more of a way to approach problems, you know, than, than a uh, prescription, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's a just in case learning module. So it is uh, problem solving is what we're focused on. And so I can tell you a bit about what uh, we're doing um, in our classes in computer science, Charlie. So with the expanding uncertainty of the pandemic, I certainly give a lot of credit to the Department of Computer Science, which also includes um, the new information technology program. So in early May, we anticipated the possibility of needing to teach online in the fall. And we have been preparing for that as a team. And in the, problem, and, and in the spirit of problem solving, we have, staken, we have taken some structured measures to mitigate that uncertainty. So this includes, for example, making sure that uh, we are making the expectations for each class very clear to the students from the first day so that there are no avoidable surprises in the midst of so much uncertainty. And our online courses will be held synchronously, which means that the students need to log in during their class time and need to be prepared to act actively participate with their classmates and instructors as they would in a face-to-face -face, um, class. So, and just to the point that you were making, Charlie, in computer science and in information technology courses, we emphasize hands-on learning. So it's the just-in-case learning. So there's usually a lab component, a hands-on lab component associated with every new topic uh, that our students learn. 
so the students are required to apply their new learning um, you know, within a week. So even in our online format this fall, my colleagues and I will be requiring that our students start these labs online synchronously so that the professors are present to answer any questions right away and we can guide them in the right direction. And, and again, just to make another point, one of the things that we do um, in the Department of Computer Science is our initial, our, you know, our introduction to programming courses, we teach um, the syntax, the problem solving concept, right? Uh, but we teach it in Java. However, we teach, um, we, you know, we could have certainly taught any of those concepts in another programming language. And then later on, the students are introduced to C++ and when they go to higher level um, classes, they're introduced to Python, to R, to other programming languages. So our philosophy is just that. We teach them problem solving. We teach them the fundamentals of the, the computational thinking so that they can apply that with whatever new technology or programming language they would have to, they would see in, in industry. Yeah, certainly that gives uh, students the ability to uh, uh, to switch gears, to pivot in and out of languages. Again, it sounds like you're, you're baking into your teaching the ability to learn, unlearn, relearn, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that's terrific. Uh, you know, Joel, with that, you know, and Nasley touched on, on COVID, I guess I would be remiss today if we didn't have a, you know, a, at least touch upon, you know, the global pandemic. Um, you know, obviously Millersville University, clearly Penn Manor School District, you know, our, our educational institutions institutions are being forced to pivot and, and rethink decades and decades of how, you know, we, we conduct business, right? You know, the business, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the business and the human art of education. Um, you know, what are you seeing locally, you know, with businesses that, that your company works with in terms of how they're pivoting, um, you know, and, and being agile in the face of, you know, a significant black swan event? Sure. Um, boy, everybody remembers February. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so like any small business owner, um, we uh, cringed like and braced for the worst. Um, you know, we were fortunate in many ways. Um, you know, we already had wor people working remotely. It was very easy for us to go fully remote at the drop of a hat. We'd already had a, an employee handbook, you know, procedure and policy for, hey, how do we communicate as a team working remotely? And I would offer that advice to anybody who, who's now newly working remotely, having just, this is how we, you know, this is how we do things now, is, um, you know, uh, written down is very valuable to have. Um, in regards to the actual impact, um, I think the biggest shift for us uh, so we, we have gone through the entire pandemic. We haven't had a single layoff or a pay cut. We've been fortunate in that regard. Um, and in fact, we've seen um, uh, some growth. And I think that this is one of the interesting things of the pandemic for us is, um, is that it, you know, in a normal economic downturn, there's a lot of history to look at for that. In, in this instance, the, the lines of fracture in terms of like who really was negatively affected and who really, you know, uh, some companies really kind of exploded. We just kind of stayed normal. Um, you know, it, it, it fractured along different lines this time. So we feel very blessed and fortunate in that regard. Um, we have, uh, we've gone fully remote. We have um, uh, seen the, and it, some increases actually in, um, the way that we collaborate as a team, there's a certain acceptance of it that's really been very powerful. Um, uh, the, our biggest impact was really our sales pipeline dramatically shifted, right? So much of the way that you don't just uh, go shopping for custom software. Um, by the way, you know, like you shop for off the shelf solutions and things like that. So for us, a lot of just meetings and meeting with people, networking and just like hearing about people's problems you know, cause like I said, what we're really doing is problem solving using technology as our medium. Um, that was our chief uh, lead generator. And so with the pandemic that took a, a huge hit and we've had to really shift our expectations. Um, now we, we probably saw about net 260 K like pipeline, um, sort of just stall or go away. We've seen probably about 200 new, uh, like, Basically, I would even describe caused by the pandemic, you know, because it uh, created a different sort of shift. Um, and then we've had uh, other initiatives that really weren't phased by it very much that were continuing on. But um, I would say in terms of the expectations of 
what people are shopping for and how we go about doing business. That's been the biggest shift. But operationally speaking, um, it's actually been a great opportunity to tighten a number of things up. So. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, something I, I definitely wanted to make sure we had time for uh, was a discussion, you know, Nasli, you, um, about diversity and inclusion in the technology industry. Uh, Nasli, you've been doing some terrific work, you know, over the past several years with the, uh, the Women in STEM conference at Millersville University. Um, unfortunately, this year it was canceled, <laughs> you, know, a, uh, you know, obviously due to, uh, to COVID, but can, can you talk to us a little bit about that program and uh, that effort to, uh, to, to really broaden uh, the ability for, for all individuals to uh, become part of the technology community in Lancaster? Yep. Thank you, Charlie. So what I'll do is I'll first talk about um, just generally why it is important to have representation of women and underrepresented minorities um, in STEM fields. And then I will be delighted to talk about the conference itself. So, you know, I have been very passionate about the representation of women and underrepresented minorities in STEM fields for quite some time because I know firsthand that representation matters across the board and for a couple of main reasons. One is that if students or if young people are not able to see themselves in role models in the STEM fields, then it is harder for them to imagine themselves in careers in those fields. And also, as we have seen with just the recent global events, Without representation of all groups, we cannot appreciate the full scope and depth of the problems. And without that full scope, any solution will always be incomplete and lacking effectiveness. So in effect, institutions are not doing underrepresented minorities a favor by, doing, by being inclusive of them. If anything, institutions are garnering a greater scope of success for themselves by ensuring that they are inclusive and have so many voices, a scope of so many voices. So certainly a key way to promote diversity and inclusion is to ensure equity of access to both information and also to mentorship. So I have been, a very, I have been very proud to be um, a part of our Women in Science and Technology Conference. Uh, which gives middle and high school female students from Lancaster and the surrounding counties access to a conference that features prominent and renowned um, female leaders in STEM careers who act as role models and importantly, and, and importantly as mentors uh, for these female students. The, and these participating students are able to engage with up to 20 of these uh, mentors um, at every conference. So as you mentioned last year, our, uh, well, this, this year in 2020, we did have to cancel our conference. So for this coming year in 2021, again, in the spirit of problem solving, the conference committee has decided to conduct the conference virtually. So this will allow us, and in particular, my colleague, uh, Ms. Marianne France, uh, who does the lion's share of the logistics, to organize the logistics ahead of time without the threat of cancellation. Also, this virtual conference uh, will give us a greater freedom to invite a keynote speaker and STEM mentors from around the world. Uh, and the, the virtual conference would also possibly allow us to invite some additional female students to the conference because we're no longer bounded by physical space. So really, uh, Charlie, I am uh, sincerely proud to be a part of this, of our Women in Science and Technology Conference, which is in its 34th year, and it continues to create equity of access and mentorship for young women and for underrepresented minorities, even in the time of a pandemic. Yeah, that's great. This is, this is so important. I'm, I'm sorry, Joel, I think I cut you off. I was just, did, she, did you say 34th year? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's this incredible. Year started by uh, Mr. Charlie Wolf uh, at the university 34 years ago. Wow. Yeah. 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 What, what I love about this is it, it promotes an open mindedness an inclusive open mindedness about, you know, and, and community, you know, that's, that's working together to solve problems. Right. You know, and, and really making sure that every voice is heard. You know, um, I, th I think both of you are, are familiar with, there was uh, a few years ago, there was uh, research that was done uh, that indicated uh, that some AI software, 
was right. blind, the facial recognition portion of AI was blind to certain individuals, you know, based on their skin color, right? And, you know, I think that underscores how important it is to make sure that we have all voices at the technology table as we're building and creating software, you know, to, uh, to make sure that input is there, right? So, so we are not, you know, unintentionally excluding individuals. Um, you know, Joel or Nazi, I don't know if you have a comment about that. Yeah, Charlie, and if I just, I also want to say that I also think the, the framing of it is not, again, it's not that it's the institutions or companies are doing minorities or underrepresented minorities right. a favor, like, oh, well, we're, okay, we will accommodate you. It's actually not that. It's more that without that inclusivity, you do not have right. the scope of the solution. So I also think it's a shift in the way we talk about it, in the way we address it, right? So it's a matter of, all right, what can we do together instead of, all right, well, let's think of how we, sh we can include you since we have to include you, right? So it's also yeah. that, mm -hmm. the way we talk about it. Absolutely, yeah, go ahead, Joel. Uh, I mean, geez, on that note, like, man, uh, I'm sure everybody, you know, another, major event that's happening right now in our world, right? You know, the Black Lives Matter movement and things of that nature um, have really been swelling and every company, you know, whether it's publicly or, you know, quietly is thinking about it and talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we at Indie Res um, and just in some of the things that I've been involved in, you know, we too have been just working this diversity and inclusion problem for years with very, I mean, very frustrating results. I can just get disheartened very you know uh, at times and um and what this experience recently has helped me with is you know how do i how do we start um embracing black culture as a company instead of embracing um a black person that embraces our culture right because we have all white people working at indie res we have we have some women but, um, you know, the, the reality is we don't have a huge workforce around here and it's hard to find that talent. The numbers, uh, you know, there's a real numbers. There's a limitation of, of access to, to actual resources. And so I, I'm a big fan of, of um, not doing favors, but certainly acknowledging some people have an ex additional challenges, you know, just by the way this system has been designed um, and trying to look for opportunities to make it more easy. Uh, for, for um, you know, anybody to get into this field that historically would have been kept out. Yeah. But um, I've really been just focused on that. How do I embrace Black culture instead of embracing a Black person that's going to embrace, you know, um, the way we do white tech, you know? And that's just been, it, that, that thought just doesn't go away. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Nasley. So you, since you asked the question, I can give you my perspective. Uh, and that is one of the ways is to be a mentor or to, um, or to promote mentorship from within your company, right? Because it is the mentorship that uh, gives the equity of access. It is the lack of equity of access, the lack of mentorship uh, that sometimes keeps uh, people away from certain industries. So that's a great place to start. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Nasley. Yeah, this is really about cultivating the type of community, you know, that we, we would like to see in Lancaster County. Uh, Joel, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the other efforts that uh, are happening here, you know, the tech scene, the, uh, the community here in Lancaster County? Uh, you know, this is uh, a discussion, I think, of the Central PA uh, Open Source Conference, you know, what's happening with local area networks. Uh, talk to mm -hmm. us a little bit about some of those, those efforts uh, for building community here in Lancaster. Yeah. Um, well, geez, it's funny. I mean, we, because of the, this dearth or, or not dearth, um, gap, you know, absence of talent, right. You know, that's available to companies. I don't think people realize that the industry segment as of tech in Lancaster is so small because, because of that blocker. So, I mean, we have poured focus into this. I have been thinking about this for years. I serve on the state's uh, workforce development um, board subcommittee for career pathways and apprenticeship programs. Um, I helped uh, Thaddeus Stevens create a two-year associate's degree program. Um, and we've been doing, you know, internships and, and mentoring, you know, like for so long. But a big um, area of focus for us was always the community itself. 
um, because there's a lot of um, individuals that this the traditional way of going about statistics it, we just don't count it you know here in this in this town and most of the talented programmers here they're living here because of the cost of living while working for a Seattle or Silicon Valley based company and they're making bank and and they're they're the smart programmers are in our workforce they're just giving their work to 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 other people so um, we have been trying to essentially do anything possible to connect those smart individuals with um, with more up and coming learners to to you know get that level of skill and just more of it you know so that we can overcome that so um, some of the things that we've been doing uh, re most recently uh, we formed a nonprofit called local area networks um, and that is a as Charlie mentioned earlier not five one c three um, and it is all about um, creating opportunities for the professional and amateur tech community to grow through educational opportunities, through convenings and meetings, um, and also to collaborate on projects. And um, so essentially being, giving that uh, sort of nonprofit partner that brings us uh, some access to, um, you know, some workforce development funds, state funds. And this is all incredibly important because, you know, so I'll give you an interesting fact. Um, you probably know that every across the state workforce board you know, we have uh, uh, standard occupational codes right part of the NAIC system but SOC codes for everything for every occupation we have now it's up to the local workforce board in every area to petition to you know say here's how many SOC codes we have in uh, you know uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh you can count probably seven to 10 SOC codes in the sphere of what we would call tech industry. In Lancaster County, we count two. Um, that's a major inhibitor because without that code, we can't actually apply for you know, additional grant dollars and funding from the state for training programs. So some of those things are where we focus that um, energy just to essentially we're trying to modernize Lancaster um, uh, you know, and, and, and learn from the experience of both the individuals and the other, you know, those around us that um, are doing it well, you know, and we're just sort of sitting by the wayside. So Local Area Networks is about being a partner to help those initiatives move along uh, for certain. Another thing that we recently got, should I wait on that, the tech industry partnership, Charlie? Or? No, please, no, keep, no, keep rolling. <laughs> All right, so the... Um, and this is really neat out of the PA Smart um, grant opportunity. We were awarded, a partner of mine and I, uh, were awarded um, a convening grant, uh, which essentially was to, to form what they call a next gen um, sector partnership. So we formed what we now call the Lancaster Tech Industry Partnership. And um, <laughs> how does one do this? Um, for me, it was flipping through my Rolodex and emailing uh, various tech companies and business owners and, and that I've met and known in this uh, county uh, for a long time and saying, we're getting together to sort of talk about hey, what are our shared challenges? Where are we held back? What can we do better as a group, you know, to, uh, to tackle some of these issues? It, um, if uh, some of those challenges and issues ring true, it's sort of a voluntary basis. Those companies can sort of assign some people to, you know, throw together a co-op team, maybe with some, uh, you know, influence and input from, you know, educational partners, uh, grant partners, nonprofit organizations, you name it, but they'll work together on these individual projects. So that's something that's really getting off the ground um, right now. And uh, we've got a great uh, facilitating uh, partner in CoLab which is a consulting firm that's helping us uh, sort of like spearhead that. But I mean, for the people listening today, um, if you know tech companies in Lancaster that are interested in having their voice heard, I mean, please join the Lancaster Tech Industry Partnership. You can do that by reaching out to, uh, to us at, I think it's LancasterTechIndustryPartnership.com. Um, but that's a, that's a major um, new, newly emerging group that will, um, you know, do all the things I mentioned, but I think more importantly, create an approachable entity. You know, if you want to, if, if the newspaper wants to say, hey, what does the tech industry in Lancaster think about this evolving thing? Um, or the fact that we've got this clear disparity of internet access and quality throughout the county. Um, 
what's the tech industry's opinion of that? Well, now there's a place where that reporter can call. And same thing with politicians and, and you name it. So we're trying to consolidate our voices. Yeah, that's great work. Uh, what I what I love about you know everything we're discussing is that all of our efforts are they're connected, but they're also complementary. You know, and I think collectively we're working together to amplify and the uh, the total technology talent capacity here in in Lancaster County. Uh, so I think it's terrific work. Uh, what I what I certainly want to touch upon maybe the last topic before we open up for questions. You know, I I personally feel to really get at at the, at the root you know, of, of all of our needs, all of our problems, we got to back it up and we really got to start, you know, at the elementary level. And I mean, quite literally the elementary level, right? At the, at the public school level, you know, to build, to begin to build capacity and interest, you know, with, with, with young, young women innovators in computer science and, and young students to get them, you know, in a, in a mindset of, of thinking about problems in a connected fashion, to have empathy around technology. Mm-hmm. Um, so to that, you know, Nasley, I know you and I were talking, this is one of your proudest moments, right? The coding confidence, you know, course, the, the program you're running at MU. Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Thank you, Charlie. And I also, before that, I do want to commend uh, Joel for all the work that he's doing to be inclusive to uh, technologists in the area. Um, Charlie, thank you. So you hit upon the point that I know you and I have been talking about for over a decade, and it is true that I do consider the Coding Confidence Institute and it's, uh, K through, and it's for K through 12 educators. I do consider that to be a flagship of my career at Millersville University. And it is a team effort with some of the best technology specialists in uh, Lancaster. This course is designed to introduce K through 12 educators who have little to no exposure to programming, to some coding concepts and to programming languages over the course of five days, some pretty intense five days, that's true, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, The objective, again, Charlie, is access and equity of access to coding concepts from an early age. So K through 12 educators are given access to coding concepts and computational thinking, and they take this back to their student constituents in Lancaster and the surrounding counties, And that's a fairly big deal, I think. So if you don't mind, I would like to talk a little bit about how we um, structure and organize the course over our five intense days. Um, So on day one, we have our K through 12 educators. Um, They're introduced to the concept of computational thinking. Uh, And again, which is fundamentally how to solve any problem in a logical and structured manner. And many of them already do that in their classrooms, of course. Then the educators, still on day one, are introduced to HTML and some CSS by Mr. Kevin Bauer from the Hemfield School District. And by the end of the day, each educator creates a web page that they can use as a teaching tool for a topic or that they can use to disseminate information to students or to parents. Then on days two and three, our K through 12 educators are introduced to various visual forms of coding concepts by the powerhouse team of uh, Miss Rayanne Smith from Hemfield and Miss Nicole Shoemaker from Donegal, who are uh, using hands-on tools like Ozobox and Spheros, Dot and Dash and the like. Um, and the K through 12 educators are also introduced to block coding like Scratch, which allows um, the users to visualize what, for example, a function or a loop looks like. And again, K through 12 educators can either incorporate these hands-on learning activities uh, in their classrooms, or they can have conversations with students in the county and surrounding areas who are interested in learning how to code. So we're emphasizing equity of access to coding um, through this institute. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then on day five, Charlie, uh, our K through 12 educators are introduced to the Java programming language by Mr. Jeff Wiley from the Warwick School District. And Jeff is very involved with um, NCWIT, which is an organization that promotes women in technology and coding. So I feel very lucky to have these partners as my teammates in this institute. And then finally, on our day five, the K through 12 educators are introduced to the Python programming language by Ms. Brianna Caggiano, 
who is a former student of mine from Millersville University. And she is currently a software developer at ListTrack, which is in Lancaster. And she and I developed a lecture where we introduced Python side by side to what the educators learned in the visual scratch on day three. So again, they, our educators are able to look at the visual coding concept and the actual code in Python side by side. And then I reserve our heavy hitter for the very end of our five-day course when we bring in a Mr. Charlie Reisinger from the Penn Manor School District who gives the educators an interactive and enlightening session on the current state of technology in education. And the feedback we have received from the K through 12 educators has been very positive and I'm very encouraged and inspired by the access to coding concepts that students in Lancaster and the surrounding counties uh, will receive due to these K through 12 educators who sign up for this course. Charlie. Yeah, that's that's excellent. And uh, you know, having being having been a a part of uh, the program, Nosley, you know, I I am just I walked out of there stunned, you know, many many times with you know, just how our teachers are starting to understand that not only with the confidence, as you said, you know, that they can they can do this, you know, they can, they can learn the basics of programming, but I think more importantly, how they can apply that across the curriculum, right? You know, I think oftentimes, you know, educators, and I just think, you know. The, people in general think that technology operates in a silo and it doesn't, right. you know, computing technology is there to solve problems, right? You know, it's what you're training your students to do, teaching your students to do. And as they jolt, it's what you're doing. It's the core of your business, you know, and overall too, I think it's what we're all working toward, right? The problem is we want to build a better community here in Lancaster County. In our case, that happens to be through technology, you know, I'm sorry, Joel, go ahead. I just yeah. I mean, they, I'll give you, I'll give you the I'll give you the parting shot here because uh, we're going to turn it over to questions. But uh, certainly, yeah, please go ahead. Questions. Yeah. I just wanted to say, I mean, like, so that is super cool because I do think even as you were explaining computational thinking earlier, is anytime somebody that's not in the tech industry outside that silo, so to speak, hears a phrase like that, it triggers the eyes sort of glazing over, and they're you know like it's like I'm not going to pay attention here, right? But in just a short amount of time. I think what a program like you just described does, it more than the more than the concepts, the, the techniques, and the, the things, it opens their eyes to the fact that this industry is perhaps the most stable and promising, worthwhile investment for any individual's professional development. It will always yield a return for any time you put into it. I mean, it, it's it's incredible to me. We have hired people that have no college education. We, we've had high school interns that, that are just like shockingly talented. You know, like there's, and, and sometimes you will come across adults who are just looking for that career change. Like anybody can start that journey kind of like anywhere. And there's something approachable that builds. It, it's a cyclical building and it, and it continues to, um, to call people up. You know, I think that's one of the promises that tech you know, offers is that um, once you start to plug into that, that method of thinking, you stop, you get comfortable letting go of what you knew and, and anticipating what's coming, you know, and that's, that's just a very positive um, philosophy, right, for life, for everything. It's, it's about observation, what went wrong, what went well, how can we do it better next time? When you adopt a lifestyle of iteration, I mean, all things thrive. And that's what computational thinking just hammers home. So to be delivering that to teachers that can see the promise of that for their students, to me, is just incredible. And I just think it's fantastic. And I just hope people um, understand, you know, I, 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 it can seem daunting and terrible to always have to learn something new. You know, it's like tech is a lifelong education. There's no doubt about it. You never stop. It's like you're, it's a 40 year college, <laughs> you know, not a four year college, you know, and um, that's, a, that's a like starting point, you know? Yeah, that is a great, I think that's a great place to segue, right? A 40, a 40 year college with technology uh, here, here. So great. Well, thank you. Well, we covered a, a, a huge amount of ground in a very short period of time. So uh, Jonathan, I think we're definitely ready to take uh, some questions.
Excellent. And you know, the, the nice thing about the 40 year college is that you're getting actually paid to go to this. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so if down below, uh, while I'm, I'm mumbling here and I've got a question here, uh, that I'll start off with, but, uh, down below, uh, there's a question and answer function. Uh, we have a question in there now and feel free to think of, uh, things that you might want to ask our panelists, um, as, uh, as we go here. So I'm going to start off with one and, and Charlie, I'm going to pull an audible here. This is not one that I, I let uh, talk to you about beforehand, but, um, for the three of you, uh, you all are, are obviously, uh, uh, very accomplished people. Uh, there are a lot of different places you could have gone geographically for your jobs. Why, why Lancaster? Um, and I'm sure that, I'm sure that there's a bunch of different reasons, but, uh, why, why have you chosen to be in Lancaster? Charlie, I'll let you start. Yeah, sure. I can. Uh, I can address that. That's interesting because uh, okay. So, candid confession: when I was much younger, uh, I was I was very much drawn to to any other place than Lancaster, and I think that's probably a function of youth, right? Uh, but I don't know. It's interesting. So, you know, a big piece I think of what's what's kept me here. Well, a couple things. Uh, just briefly, you know, I've really come to appreciate Lancaster County's just quality of life and the people, and I think also the in many ways, the do-it-yourself mindset, mm -hmm. which, you know, is, is truly like an open source philosophy, you know, just kind of like dig in and build things, you know, so I think that, I don't know, it's just something that really resonates with me. Uh, I'll tell you a big part also, Jonathan, is uh, I'm a graduate of Penn Manor High School, and uh, I returned to work at Penn Manor High School. I would have never thought I'd go back, you know, to my old school. Was that like a Steely Dan song or something like that? <laughs> and, uh, and it was surreal at first, but, um, you know, I felt, you know, the longer I was at Penn Manor, I really felt that I could, I could, I, I was working in the most important industry in the world. And that is, that is education. I think it's the most a human endeavor. And uh, it just, it just feels great to be able to make, you know, that to, to be able to, to work in education with students in the local community. Great. Nazler, Joel, why are you in Lancaster? <laughs> um, so when I travel, um, you know, uh, and, and interact, you know, professionally or personally. Um, I, I marvel at this, at what I observe, which is that, especially if it's with others from Lancaster, it's way more apparent. What Lancastrians seem to do by nature, by default, is exceptional in most other places, it seems. I, I really do see that quite a bit in terms of like the diligence, the sense of like, if my, if this is going out with my name on it, I'm, I'm taking a certain amount of responsibility for that. Um, there's a pride in, in that work. Um, and I have always loved the concept of what does a Lancaster County take on Silicon Valley? You know, I don't want to turn Lancaster into a Silicon Valley. I don't want to see, you know, uh, the idea of any sort of a, of a structure where 90% of our projects fail and, and the money goes down the drain. It's never going to fly. Not here. That seems like ridiculous. Um, but I think that the, the people that do live here and work as programmers, like they, it's a pretty unique bunch. Like it, they, they kind of get infused with that. Maybe it's the smell. I don't know. Um, but the, you know, whatever it is about Lancaster, uh, it sort of turns us into like, um, you know, we can put our, I, I guess I'll say that. I, I've always, one of the reasons I'm not a programmer and one of the reasons I decided to make my career in, in surrounded by programmers all the time um, is because I realized the power of what they can do if they are presented with the right problem. It is very powerful and they will iterate and iterate and iterate and they will solve it. And if you, so I kind of look at my job as putting the right problems in front of people, in front of the right people. And it's just that in Lancaster, we do that. You know, we really do that very well. And so, that's, you know, if we all agree there's a problem to solve, we're going to do it. And I think um, that comes from kind of the culture and what's all infused in us. So why am I in Lancaster, Pennsylvania? Right. So I ended up here a little bit by chance because I moved from New York City and I've certainly lived in other places around the world. I had not even heard about of Lancaster, Pennsylvania before I moved here. In fact, the one person in New York City, when he heard I was moving to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, he said, oh my goodness, that's Amish country. You know, what are you going to do there? And so 
that's how it started. But you know, having lived in many other places and many other countries in the world, I can tell you that Lancaster is the warmest, though in terms of people, you know, the, our, it has the warmest, most welcoming group of people I have ever met anywhere in the world. And sure, you know, many things matter to me, but what really I value the most uh, is the warmth and the sincerity uh, in other people. And this is what both my husband and I, who my husband also works at Millersville University, we want our children to grow up in this environment, uh, you know, to see this daily warmth. And we want them to, where, wherever they go, wherever they end up in the world, we want them to come back home to Lancaster. And it's not just Amish country to the person who told me that in New York City. <laughs> Well, that's, uh, the reason I ask is um, it leads into the, uh, a question from one of our attendees here is, uh, you know, that with, with the tech industry, you're able to be so many different places and work in an entirely different place. <laughs> um, so the, the question uh, from Matt Glick um, is, how can someone who works at one of those Silicon Valley companies make the biggest impact on Lancaster County's tech scene? Yeah, I, I would offer up, uh, Matt, you know, and, and thank you for for uh, asking us that. You know, I would offer up, you know, we, we touched, you know, sort of briefly on several of the meetup groups and the organizations that are that are forming here in Lancaster. Uh, Joel touched on uh, local area networks. Uh, we talked about the Central Pennsylvania Open Source Conference. There are certainly opportunities to get involved in, and that could be as simple as attendance you know, at some of the local meetups, you know, at the CPOS conference, that could be as elaborate as uh, speaking, you know, or getting directly involved in those organizations. Uh, we would love to have you, you know, if you'd like to get involved, you know, especially if you're working for a, you know, a Silicon Valley uh, company, we would, you know, love to hear your perspective. Uh, so again, you can reach out to, to Joel or I about those opportunities. Joel, do you uh, have anything to add to that? Boy, um, I, I just want to upvote it. Um, I guess what you said is great. Um, <clears throat> it, it is about sharing, you know, what you, what your experience is. Um, yeah. The one audience, like the pathways, we have laid serious pathways in terms of sharing your knowledge if you're a programmer with other programmers. One area that Lancaster is very much lacking is how do we share your knowledge and experience with non-programmers, the yeah. Lancaster County business, the, you know, um, that's an interesting you know, application as well. And I would love to, uh, you know, focus on that, you know, get you in front of some people to, to share some of that stuff. You know, I let my dog out of my room. <laughs> no problem. And actually, maybe, maybe Jonathan, if we, I, I don't know if Nasley wants to add to that, but the next question I think is, is more specific to Nasley. Yes. So Madison uh, Whitcomb, asks, uh, she says, M Millersville student here. Uh, thanks for joining us, Madison. Uh, what kind of advice could be given to a student that is looking to sharpen or expand his or her computational thinking skills? Yeah, I'm not surprised that Miss Madison Whitcomb asked that. She is one of my, she is such a key student to me. You know, she is one of the students that continues to inspire me to do my job. Um, Madison, that's a great question. Madison, I had you for my discrete math class, and I hope that in hindsight, you can see that a lot of what we did, uh, each of the topics, we covered it from a concept of computational thinking. In terms of what a student can do, the easy answer I know uh, would be to say, take a programming course, but I don't think that that's the, that's the complete answer. So certainly take a programming course, but I think the key part is to find a mentor because, you know, a programming course, depending on how the professor may teach it, you know, they might teach it from a certain perspective, but finding a mentor with whom to have conversations with about computational thinking and about the applications of computational thinking um, is, would be more beneficial for a student who's starting out. For a computer science student who is taking a four-year degree, they will have that opportunity once they, you know, especially once they get to the upper level courses, right? They'll be applying a lot of their initial knowledge. They'll be applying um, that computational thinking to projects, to software engineering projects. But for a student who's starting off, other than taking a computer, a programming, uh, introduction to programming course, I would say also look for a mentor who inspires you and who can connect with you. 
Yeah, That's and uh, Madison, I hope you saw uh, I hope you saw Joe's uh, Joel's comment uh, as well. Uh, I don't know, Joel, if you want to speak to that. With a rave review like that from Dr. Hardy, you can just send me an email about an internship. <laughs> there we go. Um, I was I was gonna I'll supplement with a comment there too. It's it's um, you know back to what I said earlier. I see my job as putting the right problem in front of the right programmer. Um, find a problem that you care about solving that'll keep you engaged and coming back. You know, like, because iterating on something that you find meaningful will far and away, like, you got to get your hands on it and you got to, and you got to like chase it down. So sometimes that's finding somebody else's problem, you know, but sometimes you see something that could be created, you know, uh, and the open source, find an open source project. If you need somewhere to start, you know, to start by contributing, you'll be surprised how rewarding and integral you can become to a, uh, an open source uh, collaborating team in a very short amount of time. Yeah, I'd just like to second that, uh, Madison. Uh, you know, as Joel indicated, you know, finding an open source project, there, there are many, many, many projects out there that are looking for volunteers. You know, and that can be anything, you know, as simple as just helping to read documentation or write documentation uh, to code contributions. You know, it's also a really great way to uh, build up your resume you know, to, to volunteer some time to those, those yes. open projects and demonstrate to, you know, uh, you know, tech employers like Joel, you know, of the type of work that you've done in the past. We have a three-step hiring process, uh, essentially, and um, we are primarily looking for the work that you've done, the way you think. So we're going to, you know, um, it is important to us that more than even, you know, the your resume, you know, helps, but the but the body work you have on GitHub helps more. So contribute and take credit for the work that you do often. Great. Excellent. Uh, so in, in three minutes or less, <laughs> one, one final question here. So um, if we look around the state and, and I came uh, before, uh, I originally from Lancaster and then I moved out to Pittsburgh for about uh, seven, eight years. Uh, Pittsburgh has kind of blossomed into a tech hub. Uh, the, Google is there, Facebook is there. Um, there's Uber has, there's self-driving cars everywhere, um, which is a fun experience if you ever get to do that. Um, but so what, what about um, Pittsburgh can we replicate here in Lancaster? So you would never think of Pittsburgh as being a kind of, it's part of the Rust Belt, right? You know, you don't think of Pittsburgh as being a tech hub. So what, what can we emulate that they've, they maybe have done uh, here in Lancaster? Yeah, since our time is brief, I, I think, just one quick statement on that, Jonathan. I think the key is, is that companies are attracted to Pittsburgh because that's where they can find expert talent. So all of the initiatives we talked about today, we're building capacity, we're building talent, we're building skills. You know, we're, we're not going to have a Pittsburgh level, you know, tech scene here tomorrow, but in five years we might, right? You know, through the work that Nasley's doing through the communities, you know, that, that we're creating, you know, the partnerships that, that Joel is creating. If we, can, if we can build our talent capacity, I think we have a shot. Excellent. Joel or Nasley, any response to those? Go first. Well, I think, you know, I, I know that Pittsburgh has Carnegie Mellon and uh, Lancaster has Millersville University. So I think we're all, you know, we will be contributing our part and, uh, you know, five years from now, Charlie. That's... <laughs> um, I think my two cents is, so I, one of the most exciting projects that I've been working on and waiting iterating on, trying to get funding over and over again. PubForge, our co-working space, got certified by the state to be a pre-apprenticeship program. And um, there is an actual tech-focused apprenticeship uh, program uh, sanctioned by the state um, that exists. But there are, to my knowledge, maybe only two or three companies in the state that are actually willing to hire an, an apprentice. Um, and I am... I, I believe, you know, very, I'm very much in line with uh, Dr. Hardy about mentoring being the most, it's just the best way to be educated, truly. And everything else is supplemental. But if you can learn from somebody who is doing this with their, with their hands every day, um, those opportunities are amazing. And the challenge that we have is that with apprenticeship, we can't, we're not like the trades where you can sort of just get thrown in day one. 
um, you know, and you've got your safety classes and you've got, you know, but if you've got some muscle and some gumption, you can really get, get going. In tech, it's it, the lay of the land is that we don't, a lot of tech companies, that, that's a little too slow. That's too much of an investment. And when you consider the fact that, ah, gosh, I don't, I think it, I forget what the statistic is right now, but most tech employees job hop like crazy. Like if they're with the company for more than two or three years, that's um, unreal. And so, um, you know, for a company to consider, well, why should I invest in that person's education? You know, if they're just going to leave me, that's a big pill to swallow. So a pre-apprenticeship program builds confidence and builds a relationship um, prior to that, that commitment and investment. And it also um, starts to reinforce a stronger company loyalty. The actual stats on apprenticeship are that over 90% of apprentices will stay with their employer for three years or more. And I think it's like 80 some percent will often stay for life depending on the trade. Um, because essentially in this industry, you do have to continually learn. If your employer is willing to invest in your learning and they demonstrate that from the beginning, why would you take a risk on another company if your employer is always investing in your growth and saying, here's where the company's growing, here's where I need you to be growing. Boy, that's, that's compelling. So I think that pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs in partnership with local universities and high schools is the best way that Lancaster can distinguish itself, put itself on the map and generate a workforce that is culturally diverse and full of talent that nobody had even would have taken the time to, to know that it's there. So, well, and I think we can, uh, we'll end on that. Um, so thank you all three of you so much for not only for joining us today, but for the work you do in the community and in, 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 in fostering a tech community here in Lancaster. It's really inspiring stuff. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank Absolutely. You. Thanks for having us, Jonathan. You got it. Yes. So uh, next month, we uh, will have a First Friday Forum uh, in September, as always. Um, the topic is yet to be released, so stay tuned. Um, but uh, invitations will be going out as usual. So thanks again to our sponsors, Rogers & Associates um, and Millersville University for um, helping us uh, present these forums to you. So thanks so much. And uh, everybody have a wonderful weekend. And uh, thanks again to our presenters. Take care. Thank you.